Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Ian Green. I'm the Chief Executive of Terence Higgins Trust, um, and uh, we're here for a special streaming uh, with Tackle HIV and Terence Higgins Trust, and on both organisations' Facebook channels. Um, I'm delighted to be joined uh, this evening by my good friend, Gareth Thomas, rugby legend, HIV campaigner, and the leader of the Tackle HIV campaign, uh, and by Russell T. Davis, the screenwriter of the TV series, It's a Sin, which has just been aired, the first episode on Channel 4 uh, last week. It's such an incredibly powerful drama. We're going to be talking quite a bit about that over the course of the next uh, 50 minutes or so. And we're also joined by uh, Dr. Neka Nakuolo, um, who's a doctor and medical director, actively working in HIV at Vive Healthcare. And uh, I've known Neka for, for a long time, uh, and she's a passionate advocate for HIV as a clinician. So it's going to be a, a good conversation. So Gareth, how are you doing? Haven't seen you for a couple of months. Yeah, no, I'm doing, I'm doing well. Um, I've been uh, kind of dealing with the lockdown situation as best as anybody else uh, can. I've, I've moved house, but I'm just trying to keep myself, trying to keep myself positive, working on a lot of things for, for tackle HIV. Um, because I think what everybody kind of forgets is even though we're also focused on COVID at the moment is the reality is is sometimes it takes the focus away from from other ailments, other illnesses, other viruses. So it's it's, it's we really all guns blazing moving into next year of HIV as well. Yeah, brilliant. And Russell, your last couple of weeks have just been frantic in terms of the amount of media activity that's been generated by It's a Sin. It's been mad. It's been um, uh, a joy, though, actually, because. Um, we approached this project, a lot of us thinking that quite simply that the drama about HIV and AIDS would just go under the radar, um, that people wouldn't be interested, that, that, that they think they've seen it before, that there's nothing new, that it might be sad and miserable. So the success has been absolute astonishment. You've got an entire cast and crew and production team who are reeling with surprise, but joy as well. And here we are, we get to talk about this stuff, we get to spread the word, we get to spread the message, so it's all good in the end. Brilliant. And, and, and Necker, as a clinician, you know that uh, it's been a sort of a, a strange old time for you doctors over the last uh, 12 months, hasn't it? It's been very strange. Uh, less strange, I think, for me than for, for many of my colleagues, because I haven't been sort of um, on the front line as many of my colleagues have. But uh, hearing what, what they've been going through and the fact that, you know, many of my colleagues um, in the HIV service have been redeployed to the to COVID wards and and it's all just, um, it's been terrifying for, for many of them. Um, but but as uh, I think as you've just said, Russell, and as Gareth said, thinking about this and remembering that although COVID's been terrible, HIV is still here, remains, and people are still catching it, going through, um, you know, no, finding out that their diagnosis, take, needing to take their meds, you know, HIV has not gone away. So it's, it's wonderful that... that We've got this, and there's been so much engagement uh, with with it's a sin. It's been incredible. Well, we're now going to watch a, a clip from uh, the the drama. Hi, mum. Well, what have we done to deserve this particular honour? It's a week night. Are you okay? Do you need money? Are you all right? Just saying hello. We're just sitting down now. I made a lasagna. It was very nice. <clears throat> Folks, it's Paul Birch. His son's applied for a graduate diploma in law. It's a one-year conversion course. He said it's worth thinking about. Because have you got any work of your own? No, you have not. Well, uh, that uh, is a very, very powerful moment from the uh, from the from the drama, and uh, I won't spoil it for people who haven't seen the the, the full the full version yet. R Russ, if, if I can come to you first of all, and so what what was your inspiration to write it's a sin and and, and when did you start writing it? At life, really, I, it was the inspiration. I was 18 in 1981 and left home and went to university. And then throughout that decade, lived my life. And so it was It was about time I did that, really. It, it's, it's obviously I've written a lot of shows. And I, around about 2015, I kind of thought, well, it had been building up ever since then, but around about 2015, I kind of turned the ship around. I thought, it's time to look at this now. And then it takes years to get things made, of course, and years to get things commissioned. It's never, no one ever wants to throw money at you, especially on a subject like this. It was a tough commission. It was genuinely tough because, and I'm not 
blaming people there. You know, it's 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 their job to make entertaining drama that will draw an audience to the channel, and it's not necessarily the most entertaining subject matter, ostensibly from the outside. So um, that was a tough sell, it was a very tough sell. But I can't complain because we got there, and it's been astonishing. The reaction's just been mad. So we're delighted. We're all delighted. But yeah, life in the end, life inspired me to do it. And in terms of the, the process you go when you're writing a, a drama, was this uh, harder? Was it easier to, to write? Oh, it was very tough, this. And at the beginning, I'm normally very fast. I mean, you might think about something for 20 years. I'm fast because I've thought about something for 20 years. And, and normally I bash them down. But actually, this the first episode took about six months, and I think I had a lot of walls and a lot of layers and a lot of stuff I haven't looked at and a lot of stuff you've locked away. And memories, friends had forgotten, and 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 yeah, it was tough. But I think, I hope that's led towards something very honest in the end. And and I had to, I, I spoke to doctors. I spoke to the brilliant Lisa Power. You know Lisa. She was our, yeah. she's our, she's our factual advisor on the show. She put me in touch with an awful lot of people. And but mainly, as she talked to my friends, all my friends. I had a lot of friends who were. They were those activists. They were there in the West End. They were there in London. They were there in the eighties, and they they were they they were pushing beds for charity and singing songs and, and, and doing the fight before the newspapers paid any attention. So um, it was amazing talking to them and excavating their memories and, and, and more importantly, the memories of the people that we'd lost. Those boys were gone. Yeah, um, yeah that was the most powerful moment. And that create, created a kind of unusual show to work on, the most unusual of my life, because you had to do them justice. This is why I'm so pleased it's worked. It's nothing to do with me. It's not my career. I'm fine. I could go and write something else. It's that we've done justice to those people who died and to all of you who've spent your lives working in the field of HIV. Imagine if we hadn't. Imagine if we'd let you down. That would have been so <laughs> awful. Genuinely awful. So, um, you know, so the memory of those boys has been preserved and 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 honoured, I think. So that's Oh, that's a relief. Wow. Mm. You, you clearly haven't let us down at all. It's such a powerful, powerful piece of drama. And uh, I, I say a drama, but it resonates so personally, certainly with me. I've, it's, we, it looks like we're sort of similar ages. And so I remember uh, when I, I was... I started to then... Uh, explore my sexuality and uh, it was I think in 1983 when I suddenly started to hear about this strange virus that was uh, affecting people so when, when did you start to hear about, about HIV? I, I, can't, I knew it was a whisper I can't remember the very first time but I just didn't believe you know it was spoken as a gay can and whispers about a gay cancer and a gay flu they would say a cold would kill you and I didn't believe that it's part of what I wanted to dramatize in it's a sin there's a very big sequence in episode two of denying that, but I remember the pivotal moment, and I've, I've pinned it down to like June 1983 when a, an issue of Him magazine was published, and the front cover of Him magazine was a lot of men, naked men, it was kind of erotic but terrifying image of naked men it trapped in a test tube, or in a flask actually, in a, a flask that you use in a, in a laboratory, boiling, and the strap line across that saying, AIDS, death, plot, panic, and, um, Two of those words were correct. Um, but actually, I literally stopped in the street. I was on Juxon Street in Oxford on a really sunny day. I can remember how hot it was. And I literally stopped in the street because I went, oh, this is real. This is real. This is a real article. This is real. This is, it's ab And, yeah, for the, you know, life-changing. Life-changing moment of, like, from that moment on, life was different. Yeah. From that moment on, it was a life living with HIV and AIDS, not personally living with, but but uh, living our lives in that world with HIV and AIDS, which is extraordinary. And thank goodness for that um, that magazine. Yeah, um, it's uh, uh, my, my mine was my experience was not that dissimilar. But it was it was not him magazine. It was the News of the World. My I'm ashamed right. to say my my father used to read the News of the World, and there was a an article in 1983 again when. Uh, there was a a, a, a a chaplain of a prison uh, in um, Essex uh, was uh, died of uh, of AIDS, and the really pejorative, scandalous headline that was put there. Um, and suddenly, I was there that Sunday morning, and suddenly, then HIV came into my orbit. Um, and to be honest, I don't think it left for ever since. Um, yep. and so there were there was certainly times in my life when I 
you know, I, I thought about HIV every day and it was paralyzing at times, that sort of fear of every time you had sex, that was I going to contract HIV? Yeah, it was a very, 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 very strange time, very strange time. Gareth, when, when was it for, for you? When, when was your first consciousness of, of HIV? Um, I, I don't I don't think I ever really remember being exposed to it. I always, I, I feel all of my life, because I was, um, I'm not as old as you two guys, as you can obviously tell. Um, all, all, all of my life, through the 80, I was brought up through the 80s, and I saw the advert, and I understood well, yeah. I understood there was a thing called HIV, there was a thing called AIDS, it was a thing that could kill you, it was very contagious. But I was never exposed to it because um, I felt I had never any association to it. Because as horrible as it now sounds, the fact are, is that the reality was it only affected gay men. And certainly it only affected gay men who lived in hard cities um, <laughs> or lived in America. And it, it, it actually hearing me say these words sounds sounds crazy, but it's the reality um, of what it was. So for me, never felt that there was a sense of exposure to it. And even to a point when I when I when I moved to London and I lived in London, and I felt like I could move to London and I can be I can explore my sexuality, I can have a great life, I can have friends, I can have boyfriend i always felt again even within i think the gay community at that time there was a sense of there was a sense of yeah there's a thing called hiv there's a thing called aids but we won't really talk about it um we won't really discuss it um because it's just kind of this problem and if you have it you keep it to yourself if you have it you keep it quiet um very much and 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 the rats so i know when i sat down to watch um, what's the first episode of It's a Sin. I remember sitting down with my husband and being petrified because I'm not sure if I was ready to be exposed to the discrimination that I'd heard about and never actually had been confronted with. And as somebody who's now living with HIV, I felt this massive empathy, but also connection. So I was really afraid of the discrimination I kind of heard about as a young kid but had never been exposed to. I was really afraid of being exposed to it and how it would affect me um, and, and, and how it would hurt me. And we sat down and we watched we watched the first episode and, and, and I remember putting my hand out. My husband held my hand and um, we didn't watch the whole episode that night. As I said to Ian, I'm not very, I'm not very technolo technologically minded, that's right. So I didn't realise you could watch them all before they've actually been shown. I was like, you can't, so I didn't get that until the next day. So as I went as I went to bed, my husband was staying downstairs, Stephen, and as I went to bed, I gave him a kiss and I held him and I said, and I, was, I, literally, I said to him, I said, we are so lucky that I can sit here with you as my husband in our house where everybody knows that we're married. I'm living with HIV, no HIV negative, and we are so lucky that we can just do this because it felt like from the first episode I watched, what we do and take for granted at that time was never was 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 never allowed. So um, I think for me, seeing our first exposure of the discrimination um, that people faced um, at that time, I knew it existed, but I didn't know or didn't really have this attachment to it until watching the first episode. And that's why I think this, this whole program is so important, not just for people living with HIV to watch, but for everybody to watch, to understand. Because you know what I don't want? Is I don't ever want society to go back to yeah. how it was then, because that is a reality. That is a reality, unless we keep fighting, that what was true and horrific then could become very true and horrific in the future. Yeah. I mean, Gareth, and that's why Tackle HIV is such an important passion for you, isn't it? Because of, it gives you this really important platform where that you can ensure that HIV isn't put back into the cupboard, but it's something that is addressed and that particularly stigma. Yeah, I think, I think stigma and misunderstanding, because I think, and again, what Russell shows in, in the programme 
dumb is and well is 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 stigma and misunderstanding. You can't have one without the other. So if you have misunderstanding, then you become very stigmatized towards it because you don't know much about it. And if you have stigma, then that keeps you away from learning about it. So the two of them kind of go hand in hand. And a lot of the characters, um, a lot of the characters in there are a version of 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 who I was. They're self stigmatized. You know, they're people who live with the stigma themselves and and they they they're all so connected to each other and want to look after each other yet kind of don't want to face the reality of looking in the mirror and looking after themselves it's a very difficult difficult decision for them to make and i tell you one thing i found probably one of the most emotional things in the whole series after i watched it for me i'm i'm unbelievably close to my parents and telling my parents um was kind of you know one of the most well actually i never told my parents the press told my parents but um that, that moment when you decide to tell your parents and um i think what what I, what I found really interesting about it was that all the characters kind of tell their parents at the most traumatic time and what i found and i what i think you know i, I hope i'm right in what i saw russ in this is that every parent had this kind of hidden love, regardless of that HIV at that time. Their love for that child, who was now told them they're living with HIV, it was a, there was a sense of um, you know disbelief. But when you look at the char characters, individual characters who then contracted HIV in there, there was also a sense of disbelief in 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 there when they found out. And you get to this moment of when you know you're lying in a hospital bed, or you you have lesions, or you're ill, and you get to this point of you know, real trauma, and then you decide to tell your parents and expect them to deal with it like this. Yeah. And and I remember that I think that's kind of something that, that I looked at it and thought, you know what, I myself took years to try and understand to deal with it. These characters take years and years to cope with it and deal with themselves. Um, yet there's a sense of, I'd say selfishness in a way, that they wait till they're in the hospital bed and they say to their mother, "Ma'am, I've got AIDS," and, and and we expect the the people on the outside to deal with it in this horrific moment when they realise not just their son has got AIDS, but their son is dying. Mm -hmm. um, and I found that a really, um, a, a really like a hidden love that sometimes that sometimes we we kind of we feel is missed um, as well because we assume we justify. Um, Kind of the the way we live a life, we justify it by the world not being able to accept us. And sometimes, you know, the reality is, is that there are, there are people, parents they can trust, tackle HIV, people like Russell who are doing things to create better environments where people don't have to reach that environment of you know being able to justify that the world is against them. I mean, R Russell, they were very powerful moments in the drama. The, the whole relationships between parents and their and their sons um, and writing those must have been quite difficult or was it difficult it's kind of why i'm a writer because i love that stuff it's, right. <laughs> i mean you know many years ago around about 1991 i heard the story of the first person i knew and one of many people over the years but to be on an aids ward dying when your parents arrive to discover that you're gay that you are hiv positive that you have AIDS and that you're dying in one moment. That that, that happened. That happened a lot. Yeah. Frank, as, a, as a writer, that's that's what I'm drawn towards because I mean that that's 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 the psychology of that. I think Gareth, what an extraordinary and lovely man you are, because it's like I think your reaction to those parents says an awful lot about um some people have hated those parents and 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 I, I agree with your version. I think they are full of love that just goes wrong. It goes yeah, wrong. I, I, yeah, I could you, you know what been lied to and and it has been hidden. And I think not many people put that reading into it. And that really says I, yeah that says you have lovely parents, I think. Yeah, I yeah, because interesting, I spoke to my mom and dad this morning um, because I've been saying to my mom and dad, you know, you have to sit down, you have to watch. Oh. It's a sin. And you know they were to me, were um and and I, I found this, I found this, I don't know if I found this, I actually I found this sad because my mum and dad said, we can't sit down and watch it because we're living it. Yeah. And and that made me, that made me so, so sad because my mum and dad said we were alive in the 80s. We know, we know the prejudice that was there. Bless um, and we also know the prejudice that is still there. 
So we don't want to sit down and see a version of, of see a version of what we live in, yeah. but through somebody else's eyes. And I, I found that actually, actually, I found that really, really powerfully emotional. I, 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 I found it emotional because I'm so connected to my parents, and I kind of felt a sense of no, I really need you to watch it. But I think that they feel like a lot of the parents in the, in, in the program are. You know what? This is about my son, mm, mm. and we will deal with what the emotions, the happiness, the sadness that comes to my son's doorstep as a family. Yeah. And 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 I and, and I, that's why I just when I look at it, I always look at I always look at how everybody else kind of deals with the character because so many people just look at the character and see how the character reacts and how everybody reacts to the character. Mm. But nobody kind of looks from the inside out rather than the outside in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bless your mum and dad. They sound gorgeous. They are, they are, they are, they are amazing. And you know, again, because they lived through a difficult time. You know, they were, they were, again, the the newspaper doorstep told them I was living with HIV, and then I had to go and tell them that right. I was living with HIV and give them and give them that, that reason. That's why I always look at this kind of you know different perspective where it's not it's not all about me. It's all about people who. You know, I sit here with a tackle HIV only because of people like Ian, you know, people who helped me get to this position rather than people saying, you did well to get where you are. I'm telling you now, I wouldn't have got where I am without you know, people like Ian, without a shadow of a doubt. Neka, the, just thinking about your experience as a, as a clinician, um, I mean, what, what, what motivated you to specialise in, in HIV? What was your sort of journey? Um, it was a, a weird journey in that I wasn't drawn to it, to, to doing HIV from the from the beginning. I I came to HIV because I was very interested in sexual health. And HIV, as you know, in the UK is a very big part of sexual health. And as I started to see people living with HIV and talk to them, their stories, I think, drew me to them. The, what they were going through, and, and, and HIV is intellectually a, a really fascinating disease, and it was so, you know, in the days that are depicted by Russell's film. Um, you know, it was a disease in the beginning that nobody knew anything about, had, had no, no, no effective treatment for. And, you know, I always, HIV encompasses the whole of medicine. You know, when, when you see somebody who has HIV who doesn't have access to treatment, the diseases that you you get, the opportunistic infections, you know, you can see every every bit of medicine in HIV uh, when it's not properly treated. So, so there was also the sort of the interest in you know, as a doctor, it was an interesting disease. But but more than that, to me, it was it was the the humanity. It was it was the people. It was the stories that that they told that they couldn't tell anybody else. They trusted. They trusted us, and and I don't know how to how to put it, but but it was the human side side of it, um, and also the fact that I'm a very naturally nosy person, and, um, <laughs> and, and so I got to hear all these all these things um, about what people got up to, and you know, good, bad, indifferent, always interesting, and and yeah, and it's been a journey. I, I started doing HIV in 1996. And as, as um, you may know, 1996 was the time when we, we got the first very effective HIV treatments, you know, the, the treatments that, that were the sort of precursors to the really effective treatment we have now. And so I, I, I started at a time when, so I, I trained at Chelsea and Westminster Hospital, and we went from having two wards full of patients dying. And, you know, the, I, I won't say very much, but there was a scene um, in, in the film with, with somebody in a hospital bed alone. And that was how it was. You know, I went to a hospital in, in London, uh, not, not Chelsea, and when I went to see a patient, I was told that I had to put on a gown and a mask and gloves. And I, I said, why? Because we weren't doing that at Chelsea. Uh, and and that, was how, that was how people were, you know. And, um, and, and I went from that, from a situation where we had two wards full of people dying, to about 18 months later, one ward, that wasn't full anymore because yeah. new treatments meant that people could now live, right. and, and it's been an incredible journey. 
you know, can, can I ask you, Russ, I'm really interested to know, with, with the casting, right, because you've got such an amazing, like, a, a, like a phenomenal cast, mm. um, the the stigma and misunderstandings that still rise around HIV is still real. It's very, very real. Right? But when it came to casting, did you have to be quite specific of involving people who are LGBT or LGBT friendly to have an understanding that potentially these people, because we, you know, if somebody watches, I don't know, if somebody watches a program and they really love a character, then that person's real life existence goes into the into the, into the abyss and that person becomes that character in real life so did you have any fear from any of the characters that no you're playing somebody who is going to be very ill of this virus that has a lot of stigma around it and the, the reality that association of guilty guilty by association of you walking down the street as you could very much stick yes it, yeah 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 i mean what a bunch of people they are it's a personally on my shows we cast gay as gay or LGBTQ uh, as LGBTQ. You don't have to do that. Not everyone does that. That's not an industry rule. It's my rule, though. I think you get an absolute, I think it shines out of this yeah. program, actually. I think it's yeah. so visible. And, you know, whatever gayness is, there it is. And, um, but are you right? It's like but everyone walks into the audition having read the scripts. They they were, think they're allowed to read all five scripts. They know what they're coming for. They're also actors, Gareth. They're not deaf. They can see a great part. <laughs> give me this. <laughs> the the most beautiful part, and I sound like I sound like I'm on a publicity tour now, and I'm glad that this isn't a publicity tour. This tackle HIV. So this is honestly from the heart the most beautiful part of the whole program. And Ian, you would have loved this. Is how much they engaged with it. They're young people, wow. and and you know, some of the one of the you know, little Callum the Welsh boy is twenty years old. And you don't have to engage with the issue. You're there to learn your lines and turn up on time and deliver a performance and be lovely and go home. You don't have to plunge headfirst. And they all did. They 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 came to dinners in Manchester for the for the George House Trust. I'm part of the George House mm -hmm. Trust in Manchester. They are passionate about the subject. They they went and watched they went the documentaries, they educated themselves, they learned. And to see them do that as young people and they bonded, they got you can tell they get on on screen. You literally can. They're such a close knit team. They're gorgeous people. So that to do that above and beyond the call of duty was so heartening to see young people really engaging with it and, and to get passionate about it, to get furious about it, and to be fascinated by it, and to see what the what the situation is like now, because of course it's so different now than it was in 1881, and yet we're still a lot of the same problems attached. That is it's literally one of the great joys of my life to be with that cast as they explored that and took it into their hearts. It was wonderful. It's really well, and, and you can see from just their activity on social media that they, they really do care and they are so very passionate about what they're learning and what they've experienced it's absolutely real from our very lucky very lucky gorgeous people yeah i mean we we know that a lot has changed since uh the the 1980s i mean when i, when I, I was diagnosed in 1996 and so um i was very fortunate that um medication was becoming available even then i was told I might have about eight to ten years left to live at that point in time and for a 31 year old that was like having a rug pulled from beneath your feet but we've now got really effective uh, treatment um, and uh, that my HIV negative husband um, that I can't pass a virus on to him because that's impossible because I'm on effective treatment so loads of things have changed but I think the thing that has, has changed the least is the stigma that's uh, associated uh, with HIV. And R Russell, if I can sort of just find out from you, what, what's your, your, in your opinion, what does stigma towards HIV, has it changed so much since the 1980s? I think it's fundamentally the same. It's, it's very interesting. I have a friend of mine in Manchester right now who's trying to adopt two children. And the social workers three times have brought up in the court the fact that he's HIV positive. And he's thinking, he's literally dumbfounded, standing there going, you're not allowed to do this. And um, I'm one of his references. I, I find it hard to speak to these social workers because I'm so angry about it. And um, so, of course, it's still that. I, mean, that's, a, I, hate, to, I hate to demonize social workers who work so hard. But in this case, I, I have no choice. Um, and, so, yes, it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. You start to... Um, you know, I'm lucky to be educated by my lovely friends at the George House Trust who are such hard workers. Yeah. I'm the patron, I feel like, 
I feel like a fraud. They do all the work and I turn up <laughs> like this. And, um, you know, it's like still, you could be there with your, with your gay mates of my age, all your gay, gay little gang. You can sort of say, and this, I used to do this, you sort of say, um, if, if someone with HIV sneezes in the middle of the room, are you all right? Are you safe? And it's, you look how many people don't know the answer to that question. Still, after all the years of education, and, yeah. and still you see a little, well, either people plainly don't know, even amongst the educated, you get a little seconds feel, like, what's the answer to that? And that, that's kind of terrifying, all the work you've done, Ian, and, and, and still, in some ways, we're square, square one. You still see the little look of fear. And, um, and the real answer to that question is, is, does the man who's sneezing know his status, as you know? Um, but um, so it, nonetheless... Nonetheless, it 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 surely is better. Um, um, you know, you look at 1981, you look at 1982, people were sacked for yeah. being HIV positive. I'm sure that still happens. At least now you could go and complain and get a lawyer on your yeah. side. Whereas then you just packed your bags and went. So there is progress. We have to admit that while the fight is far from over, there is progress. Yeah, I, th I think it's just it's just not as obvious. I think what well, you know the the. The thing that startled me from watching the program was kind of the, you know, the blatant disregard for anybody's emotional well-being when, you know, you lock a patient in a room yeah. on his own and the police, Shocking. you know, are, are putting gloves on to remove protesters and the people on the street are allowed to shout before they shout. That obvious discrimination, I think, um, has has disappeared but what it's just been replaced with a less obvious form of right. discrimination and say if somebody sneezes and people know it's hiv then you know sometimes what i prefer um is the obvious form of discrimination because if someone's very obvious about the discrimination then you can confront them yes when somebody's yeah. not so obvious and they have a little look at the corner of their eye um or they just as you walk in they leave they give it five seconds before they get up and leave then that's a really cutting discrimination. You know, it's very sly. It's and it and it's ten times. How often, how often do you feel you get that? Um, I'd say, I'd say in my mind, um, because because it's not obvious. No. I kind of I kind of have to I have to ha have to accept. First of all, one thing I should never have to do, but I do, is environments. I assess situations. Right. So if I'm walking into a place where I feel I'm a stranger, yet I'm not a stranger because everybody knows I'm living with HIV, i.e. nobody really knows me, but they know my status, mm -hmm. then I assess how I act um, in that in that environment. I assess what I do um, and how I kind of go about my business because I'm afraid if I do things, I don't want to be hurt by that discrimination, so I don't want to do things that would cause a form of discrimination, and I assess whether I go into that environment. So I, I wouldn't say, for me, it's 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 kind of a constant thing, because what I do a lot more now is that, is, that, is, that environment that I used to assess, I now assess and think that's a difficult environment, I'm going into that difficult environment, and I'm confronting what that difficult environment um, would usually uh, bring me fear of. But I, I, I'd say it's quite, you know, it's not, it's not rare um, mm -hmm. for me to be in an environment where somebody looks at me in in a, in a cutting way, or looks at me, um, or I do something and they're not very comfortable about going to an area of the room or doing something that I may have handled before. Um, so I, I, you know, it's not it's not all the time, but mm -hmm. also it's it's not rare. Um, and I always re I always know when I when I have these kind of moments. What it does, it 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 kind of empowers me to continue to do what I do with tackling HIV because it gives me the realization that it's still needed. Because so often, I think for for maybe um, the, the way it used to be so obvious, as in uh, if we talk like big cities like London and stuff, where it is still there is still stigma, there's still discrimination. Um, then maybe the people living in London don't see it so often because you know. Mm. Um, if, if it's if it's affecting the, the LGBT community, then you know you can live a very gay friendly life in London where there isn't that much discrimination around it. You can have gay friends, go to a gay gym, have gay cafe, go to gay cafes where people are not you know, they're not that judgmental because they're a little bit more educated um, on the subject. But where I live, um, I feel that 
it's kind of you know it's kind of a little bit um it's a little bit it's a little bit different as you know rush you've you're, you're, you're from Wales. You understand the the city mentality and yes, the valleys so. mentality is. Yes, as, as you showed perfectly in in in, in well, it. Really it's in. Because I'm here in the Mumbles now, which is kind of it's a little villagey part on the on the edge of Swansea, with this show going out and and it's amazing. Little old lady stopping me in the street and 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 congratulating me on it. And yeah. a woman, a woman in Marks and Spencer Day bought me a bunch of flowers. And then <laughs> they say that's for the show. And like and and then they're sixties and seventies, so that's. That's glorious. I don't. It's it's it, it, it's it's. I've never seen that happen before. This is. I keep saying it's a drama about AIDS, and then yeah. they are in 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 a, in a little villagey place where I might have thought they'd be watching BBC One or Midsummer Murders or something like that. And I, I, think, like, I think I think I think what you've done so well though is you've you've created a conversation yeah. around a subject that people usually wouldn't converse about, and you've done that by you know going into their televisions, um and. In a, you know, at, at nine o'clock in an evening, where you, you know, a wife, husband, two children are sitting, they wouldn't talk about HIV or AIDS. Yeah. All of a sudden, the transmission of it's a sin in that room brings that topic up, and people go, yeah. "Oh my <laughs> word!" You know what? I, I was like that in the eighties. I was one of the, I was the guy on the bike shouting, "You faggots! You queers! You!" Oh my god, I'm, I'm embarrassed. Okay, I need to make sure my children haven't learned anything from me, and I think that's what you've done with this. Is you? I mean, you must find that okay, must you? Did it. The things to be talked about is better, isn't it? That's yeah. medically, holistically, the best thing you can do. Definitely, and and I mean, and I think that the fact that people are talking about it now is is really great. But m my worry, a little bit, is that in a week or two or two months they'll stop talking about it yeah. and yeah. they'll move on. And the reality is, as Gareth was saying, okay, you you don't shout at people in the street anymore, and you don't. You don't put poo through their letterbox anymore. But stigma is alive and well. It's yeah. here. It, you know, and we see it. I, you know, I have patients who hate coming to the clinic because they're worried, scared that somebody will see them walking through the door knowing that that's the HIV clinic. This still happens. Yeah. People who don't want to stand at the clinic pharmacy because there's a whole group of other people standing at the clinic pharmacy and people will know that they're <laughs> HIV positive. It's here, and you know, and one thing that we don't talk about, but that I think is really important, is about stigma in healthcare. There's a huge amount of stigma in healthcare. Um, you know, clinicians who are supposed to be the protectors of people, of their patients, are sometimes the worst perpetrators of stigma with regard to HIV. Still, and okay, still, right. still, wow. and 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 so, and and the, the trouble is because it's not overt, we think it's not there. You know, I've been looking at at um, social media posts, just looking at what people are saying. And it's wonderful how they're engaged. But there are a lot of people who are saying, well, it's really good that it's not like that in the UK anymore. Yeah. And it is like that in the UK. It is. It's just, it's just that you don't see it. But if you ask people living with HIV how they feel and how they're treated and how, hopefully not so much anymore, but certainly in the past, you'd be put at the, at the end of a clinic, at the end of a surgery, surgery, surgery list because of worries um, uh, about contamination. That that doesn't happen anymore. It, but, it, but it sometimes happens. And, and you know, these things shouldn't happen. So you sometimes uh, face consultants and, and uh, who are ignorant about HIV or, or biased? I mean, I, 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 it's hard. I, think, I think most stigma comes from ignorance. And I think um, uh, yeah. Gareth mentioned this earlier. I think a lot of it is that people don't know. And even even today, there are still people who who think that you can catch HIV in ways that it's not possible to get to catch HIV yeah, from toilet so. seats and things like that. Still, people people yeah. think that. And I think that that as HIV physicians, we do need to do more to educate our colleagues. Um, and 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 certainly, and I, you know, we've we've come a long way. Most most people, most people who work in a hospital, even if they don't, or, or work in in medicine, even if they don't uh, have HIV patients you know, look after HIV patients, know a lot about HIV. But but there's still much more to be known. You know, we, we you were just talking about uh, this issue of not being able to pass it on. So this 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 is that people who have um, who are on treatment and have what's called an undetectable viral load. So a level of virus in the blood that can't be detected by the tests that we do can't pass HIV on to their sexual partners. This is known now. It's, it's a fact. It's not something that 
is is you know in theory you know if you are if you have an undetectable viral load you can't pass hiv on to your sexual partners so people who are positive do not need to be worried if they if they have an undetectable viral load that they that they will transmit hiv but also people who are negative um, as is the case with both both Gareth and Ian have negative partners and they know that they don't um, that they that they that they won't catch HIV from their partners because their partners are on effective treatment. But a lot of people still don't know this, and a lot of um, non-HIV doctors don't know this. And I think that this is a message that we that has to be spread far and wide, and and it gives people such hope, you know. Um, so there's a lot that still still needs to be done, even in even in medicine. Was there ever a thought process, Russ, in 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 because I this is something when I watched it, right? And I thought to myself, oh, we, we, look where we are now. <laughs> and I, I kind of I, I thought I wonder, you know, was there ever a thought process of showing where we were, of showing also where we are? Or did it kind of have to end? Oh, there was time for it to be. As ever, we didn't have enough money. You might notice it's a five-part series, which is very unusual. And uh, there's kind of a, there's kind of a missing sixth episode, which is set in the present day, which took 55-year-old Jill back to the Isle of Wight to discover why that family was exactly like that family. And along the way, you would have seen the state of, you know, almost her. Sometimes that disbelief you feel the the the. the the good news about HIV now that it's still a shock to it's I'm still astonished by how good the prognosis is now which is it's you know when you've been brought up through the 80s and 90s it's like god we should celebrate every day shouldn't we what a what uh, mir miracles they are I'm amazed by those doctors Nika doctors who don't know this about U equals U that's that's my head spinning from that what are they doing what do they do all day <laughs> Well, I think, well, I, I think you know. I think we all need to. We 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 just all need to, need to spread the message, and you know, yeah. many people do. Um, and yeah, I, I think we we all just we all just need to talk about it all the time. And the reality is, you know, we've come. We have come so far. You know, people um, with HIV who are on treatment have a normal life expectancy. They, you know, it's just so different. Um, and and you know. But but to me, you know, there, there's been a rollout of antiretroviral therapy all over the world. There's lots and lots of discussions about new treatments and so on. But to me, we will never end HIV if we don't get rid of stigma. It's it's stigma that will that will you know that will kill people it's because treat, treatments work. They're really effective. But if people are stigmatized, then they won't come forward to have an HIV test. They won't, so they won't know that they're positive, um, and then they die, or, or they or they become really ill. When in fact, if they felt they could come forward for an HIV test and be diagnosed and started on treatment, they would have a very different life. N Neki, you mentioned uh, the importance of, of testing and, and, and stigma being a real barrier for people mm. to get tested. Well, I mean, next week's HIV testing week, um, when we focus on encouraging people to know their status and to get tested. And, and Gareth, I know it's a real passion for you to, to encourage people to to get tested for, for HIV. Why, why for you is that so important? Um, I think for me, and I think Russell did it in the show with Ollie, the lead character, when he sits there and he's he's afraid, he's afraid of finding out his status because I think he feels that what comes with, what comes with a positive test is not, the life that he feels he wants. So what comes with a positive test is, you know, getting ill, having to having to confront his family, which he knows not confront his family. But the reality is, is that was set in the eighties, and getting tested now, the the justification for not getting tested is that you feel everyone's going to discriminate against you, and your life is not going to be worth living. But that isn't the reality. The reality is, is that getting tested and if you are found to be positive, then when I was first diagnosed with HIV, you didn't start treatment straight away. You had to wait till you got kind of almost to a, what I felt was quite a dangerous level. I, and what was scary for me was I realized I was ill. I didn't feel ill, but I realized I was well ill. Because when I started taking medication, I felt better. Yeah. But I didn't know. I was ill, and it was so so scary. I mean, so scary for me. Um, so to to realize that it can it can kind of onset on you without you realizing or without you knowing and thinking that everything is okay, 
you're just kidding yourself. And to have that test, to start treatment straight away and realize that life will continue exactly the same way as it did prior to your test. It will not, it doesn't have to in any way, shape or form change at all. It's just because of the stigma, because of the understanding, because of everything that have people feel like it's going to be kind of that, that life-changing moment where you walk out of it and your life is ruined. And now we're so lucky with what, you know, scientists and medicine, how far it's come, even to a point of, you know, I know, I know Ian, Ian can have this, you don't even have to go through the, shouldn't be, but the reality, you don't have to go through the shame of going to a clinic. You can do a test in the comfort, in the comfort of your own, in your of your of your own home. Um, and then, you know, you can have someone to, to deal yeah. with. You can have counsellors who are going to support you. They're going to help you. So there's so much help there um, that for me, I understand the fear. The fear is not the reality. Yeah. And this is why we love you, Gareth. You're what, the, the, one of the biggest advocates I know for yeah. HIV testing. And it's so important uh, for people to uh, know their HIV status and and testing is so easy and normalizing testing is something we all uh, need to continue to do but that stigma remains that big barrier for people to get tested yeah for sure and i say that is that you know i test every hiv testing week i stand in the kitchen with my husband and he gets tested now he's not at risk because I'm his husband. But the reality is, is that I he needs to get tested because for me, if my husband is afraid of being tested, so even though he has no cause to be afraid, yet that test is a scary thing for him. I'm not a very good advocate if I didn't say, I know just, this, just having this test, even though you know it's going to be negative, even though you know that that test is still, is still scary because in your mind you think, on oh my word, you know, on oh my word, hang on. So I make sure that he does it every single year. Um, and I advocate for everybody to do it because, you know, I just feel as if everybody does it, you know, we and Ian are lucky enough to sit on a panel where we're going to uh, commit select committee to hopefully end HIV transmissions by 2030. And that means everybody on that in that week has to test themselves for us to be able to kind of, you know, be able to continue finding the people who are and who are passing it on yeah listen our, our time is slowly coming to an end it's been an amazing conversation and uh, uh the, the the time has has flown by russell just once again uh from uh all of us um and from the, the reaction i think you've seen on on social media but in from particularly from the, the hiv sector thank you so much for telling a story so powerful um and you know it certainly made me uh laugh at times hilariously and, and raucously and then i sobbed and i sobbed and i sobbed um and it was painful at times but also exceptionally cathartic as well so thank you so much for telling that story so authentically well mate from someone from you people doing the real work that just means the world thank you thank you thank you and, and Twice, twice in my life now, Russ, you've like, you've kind of, you've opened my Queer as Folk and um, I, I, I used to sit and watch Queer as Folk and think, wish one day, one day my life. And now, and now, and now you brought this to me, which is something that I care about. I turned you, know, you so, I turned you, that's what I did. You did, you did. <laughs> I was a bloody straight rugby player before you came along. If only uh, I had that power. I can't believe yeah. you. I would use and, that power for ill. And, but I just say, I think what you've done now on, on, on this subject has, again, it's ignited a conversation that needs to be had. And for us who work in this in this area, I think all we can do is, you know, on behalf of myself and, and Ian Everyone and to trust it, Akron, HIV, Aviv, is thank you for creating a conversation which makes what we do a lot easier. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all very much.